Well, I uh, got orders to Sam Houston in the spring of 1962. Sam Houston was uh, commissioned at, uh, in Newport News, Virginia. I joined right after commissioning. Uh, my job was uh, diving officer and damage control assistant. Uh, we went on the uh, regular trials after commissioning and work up for deployment that summer. And uh, early fall, we deployed, uh, stopping in Charleston, South Carolina first to load 16 Polaris missiles. After that, I was ordered to Commander Submarine Division 41 in Charleston. Uh, I arrived there and shortly thereafter occurred the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I remember loading out my five boats, deploying them around Cuba. And uh, what many people did not know at that time, perhaps don't know to this day, is the Russians told President Kennedy, you have Jupiter medium-range missiles in Italy, Turkey, and Greece looking down our throat. Why should you object if we put medium-range missiles in Cuba? Early October, we went to sea from Charleston, and within a few days, we received the news about the so-called nuclear uh, Cuban Missile Crisis with uh, Russian missiles uh, installed in Cuba and a uh, dispute between the United States, President Kennedy, and Premier Khrushchev, Soviet Union. And uh, President Kennedy, among other things, ordered a naval blockade. Sam Houston Blue departed Charleston, South Carolina on its first Polaris deterrent patrol, October 15, 1962. On October 22nd, while en route to the North Atlantic, we received a message that it set DEFCON 3, and the, uh, we were directed to proceed uh, at best speed, maintaining continuous communications uh, to our assigned patrol area. Uh, we were ordered to set the missiles from safe to arm, to preserve provisions, and to wait for additional orders. Uh, the only explanation given for the order was quote situation in the Caribbean unquote. The um, over the next 24 hours, we were able to find some shortwave channels, especially the Voice of America, that enabled us to piece together snippets of President Kennedy's address to the nation, providing more details in what we now know as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, thus, we were able to, maintain, to provide a summary of events uh, for all hands. We were on patrol in the Atlantic. We were outside that blockade area. Uh, we got uh, uh, daily updates on what was happening. And within a few days of this uh, so-called missile crisis, uh, we were ordered to prepare to launch. Our, our uh, mission was to remain undetected and to be ready to launch these uh, Polaris missiles uh, against selected targets. We did uh, do what we were trained to do. Uh, for the first time, we, the captain and the weapons officer uh, got the appropriate codes out of the appropriate safes and entered them into the right place. And we were ready to launch. Uh, as diving officer, my job was to keep the ship uh, stable and uh, a stable platform. Uh, we had to be less than three knots, I believe, and uh, on a steady course and speed. Uh, that was sometimes difficult in uh, sea state, uh, but we were able to do it. It was hard. It was difficult, and uh, I had a my, my captain was uh, Captain William P. Willis, a very uh, uh, 
a gentleman in every respect. Uh, but when we were, when I was having a hard time keeping the ship on depth and steady in order to be ready to launch, uh, he, he didn't lose his cool, but he raised his voice <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Uh, my recollection is we stayed at this uh, heightened condition of redness for several days, but on this first order to prepare to lunch, we we made all those preparations, uh, and that that phase probably lasted uh, a few hours, no more, and then we were ordered to stand down. Uh, we resumed heightened. Uh, state of alert operations, but not ready to launch. And then a day or two later, we got the same order again. We went through through the same process. And uh, after uh, some time, we were told to cease that uh, that condition, stop that condition. Went back to normal patrol, and the uh, missile crisis was then resolved, or at least the crisis was resolved, uh, the, the uh, blockade was removed, and President Kennedy and uh, Premier Khrushchev had a re arrived at an agreement. The, the Soviets would take their missiles out of Cuba, the United States would take its missiles out of Europe. Kennedy withdrew those Jupiter missiles. And it upset many of our NATO allies, of course. He didn't consult with them. And in order to placate our NATO allies, it was determined that three Polaris submarines uh, from Holy Lock would patrol in the Mediterranean. The reason for three submarines was that there would be one in transit, one in upkeep, and one on patrol. So having three ensured one on patrol. In December 1962, we were in New London, Connecticut, our home port. The commanding officer, the executive officer, the navigator, and I were alerted to prepare for the second Blue Crew patrol, which was to be conducted in the Mediterranean. With information systems that were generally available uh, and records available at that time, it was extremely difficult to research uh, any past reports of nuclear submarine operations in the mid. The, uh, this was all compounded by security limitations. Why would an SSBN operations officer be looking for information on submarine operations in the mid? Uh, the, so as far as we knew, no one else in New London uh, knew about the plan for Sam Houston's second patrol. Um, in January 1963, we were able to meet with a small group of officers who would be establishing the Submarine Operating Authority in Naples, Italy. The, uh, we also attended a briefing in Washington on the, on the plan it was a, a meeting was in the uh, executive office building adjacent to the White House. Uh, I can't recall any particular individuals who were there, nor even the agenda of the meeting other than to, to brief some people. The, um, I, it was pretty clear to me though that I was low man on the totem pole in the room. Time passes. We come back off our patrol, go through our three month training, get ready to deploy for our next second patrol. And we were told, we were in New London, we were told uh, to, when we loaded out, we were told to take our uh, summer uniforms. Mm -hmm. Now our home port was New London, but our operating base was Holy Lock. So uh, we were told from go from New London to Holy Lock with summer uniforms. So we did. I guess next, uh, I had orders. Well, I got I got a phone call when I was in Charleston, and it came from Bupers, and the uh, 
I knew the submarine detailer. And he said, George, how'd you like to go to Paris? And I said, I was taken aback. I said, France? And he said, yes, we need to get you over to shape as quickly as possible. Because of these submarines operating in the Mediterranean, they don't know anything about the submarine force and we don't want them to know anything. So he said, we need to get you over there quickly. And I said, wait, I've got two children in school and can't, can't I move over, give me a couple of weeks to, maybe I could go over and find a place to live and then bring my family. And he said, that's up to you about your family, but you've got to go. And my wife said, if you go, I go. So we pulled the kids out of school and we flew to Paris. And uh, they built a big vault for me at Shape so that I could bring publications over there which were all no foreign. And uh, I could uh, keep everything in there because the NATO allies couldn't see any of this material. Uh, special projects, well, the Supreme Commander at that time, NATO Supreme Commander, was General Lyman Lemnitzer. And uh, Lemnitzer sent for me immediately when I arrived and I was, had been assigned to nuclear operations at shape. And of course he wanted to know all about what we were doing with these submarines. I explained to him. He said there were a lot of questions over there on that staff. Would have, the shape staff was like 12 or 1500 people. And he said, I want you to brief the staff. And I said, well, General, it will have to be an unclassified briefing. He said, that doesn't make any difference, but I want them to know what we're doing down there because uh, they're still upset about pulling those Jupiter missiles out. So I contacted special projects in Washington and they, they did a great job. They sent me a great movie of a missile coming out of the water and off Cape Canaveral, of course. And uh, a lot of material. So I gave a long series of briefings, several hundred at a time, to explain about the Polaris system. And uh, that, that went very well. I became very popular because I, <laughs> everybody came to my briefing. They were all interested from all 13 nations. I enjoyed doing it, as a matter of fact. Following crew turnover, and the upkeep in Holy Loch, Scotland, we departed on patrol on March 22nd, 1963. With awareness, but not assurance, that a port visit sometime, somewhere in the Mediterranean could be ordered. As I recall, there was no one on board with experience operating a totally submerged submarine uh, in the Mediterranean. Our first challenge was undetected passage through the Straits of Gibraltar, and then dealing with extraordinary numbers of commercial ships transiting pretty well marked or pretty well traveled uh, uh, east-west uh, routes within the Western Mediterranean. We accomplished our mission without incident. We achieved alert status under NATO command and control, and we were in continuous communications. The Turks did not believe that we had a nuclear 
ballistic missile submarine in the Mediterranean. Of course, it never surfaced. The mission was to steam in random and be prepared to launch when ordered and remain undetected. As we moved through the narrows of the Mediterranean near Malta, separating Africa and Europe, we became more concerned with communications than with dodging of merchant ships. The communications were quite reliable uh, using a trailing wire antenna un until late on April, April the 10th, when the submarine broadcast became overwhelmed owing to the loss of Thresher that day. Uh, but at the time, instructions for an Izmir port visit had been transmitted, but there were many errors. And only after the fourth and final sub broadcast transmission were Sam Houston's radioman able to piece together a clear message and order directing us to arrive in Izmir, Turkey on Sunday, April the 14th, which happened to be Easter Sunday. We deployed, I think, in probably late March or so, and we, our orders were to go to the Mediterranean. We patrolled in the Atlantic and then the Mediterranean, and we went to the eastern uh, part of the Mediterranean, and we surfaced and uh, in the harbor off Izmir, Turkey. We were showing the flag on going on liberty and confirming to Europe and NATO that President Kennedy had kept his word. And uh, that, was, that was then, and I think we've kept our word ever since. <laughs>